Well, hello, welcome everybody. This is going to be the first of a part of a lecture series in English, um, which is basically what I've been doing in Dutch for my students during the lockdowns. But I decided to make it uh, available for a broader audience. So I'm going to contemplate life. Welcome to this show called Contemplate or Your Life, where your life is being contemplated as if your life depends on it, because it does. Alright, so if we want to start, start talking about life, what is it that we want? Well, most of my students, when I ask them this during the first lessons of the year, obviously they want to be rich, sure, they want to get a lot of money. Uh, can't blame them. And you know, people that we see that our culture idolizes usually tend to have a lot of money. But obviously, uh, there's a question that needs to be answered here, and that is, does money really contribute to your happiness? And even so, maybe happiness is not even the most important thing in life, but let's go back to that later for a different show. For today, let's just contemplate, does money really make you happy? And the answer, and we have an answer because we can study it empirically by, by asking people, and the answer is, no, not really. Uh, when you have no money, sure, a little bit more money uh, kind of comes in handy, you know, when you can't pay your bills and the collectors are knocking at your door, sure, then there's some happiness to be found in you. But after that point, when you have, let's see, a, a normal income by our standards, then really there's no difference between you and a millionaire. So today I want to talk about something that may be very worthwhile to strive for in life, and that is going to be the subject of success. Sure, I'm going to be successful, and success is more tangible maybe than, than money is because you know you can win the lottery and have a lot of money but if you're successful that usually means that you're good at something and that's in itself intrinsically uh, worthwhile isn't it let's say let's think of a great football player like Lionel Messi he probably every time that he hits the ball with his left foot he makes more money than I do in a year but even even if, if that wasn't the case if he made no money there would still, I guess, be a lot of pleasure in being messy because you're so good at it, your whole body is trained uh, for years and years and you just want to hit the ball and curve it right into the angle and you have 30,000 people cheering and shouting, well, not now obviously during the lockdown, but you know, usually. So there must be some intrinsic value in success because it's really good for you to be good at something, but how do we achieve that? Well. Let's first start out by uh, contemplating the fact that you're already, a, evolutionarily speaking, a success. In the sense that uh, the fact that 99% of animals die before they reproduce. So the fact that you exist really is, by that standard, a huge miracle. Your, your parents have successfully reproduced, their parents have, and so on and so forth until back like four billion years ago. So you are the really the successful product of four billion years of evolution. Right, success is of course a relative term. If you want to be, let's say, the best at something, like in football, then someone else can be. It's relative. Uh, so not everybody can be successful. Well, we can, could ask the question, is success, um, is it fairly evenly distributed? No, it isn't. This is a well-known economic principle, the Pareto distribution, named after an Italian e economist called uh, Vilfredi uh, Pareto. And he concluded that it's always some people who tend to end up with almost all the, the, the wealth or the success or the, the fruits of your product or whatever it is, pertaining to creativity, pertaining to basically anything that you can think about. For instance, you know, uh, there's a lot of music that, that's played by classical ensembles. Well, there's five composers uh, that, that are responsible for most of the performances in classical music. That's Bach, Beethoven, Mozart, Tchaikovsky and Brahms. And even of those five, the bulk of their work is never being performed. It's just the tunes that you know, you know, the, the most famous tunes. And for those five composers, there's hundreds of them that never get performed. It's the same when it comes to you know, book writing. There's some authors who, who sell their books brilliantly and there's a lot, a lot of people who can't even get their book published. And it's the same with wealth. 
you know, just like in a Monopoly game, when you start off basically equally. And then it had, tends to have the effect that if you gain a little bit more money, okay, you sure you buy a hotel or a house or anything that you, that you do to gain more money. So if you have a little bit more money, then you have a, already a bigger chance of, of gaining more money. So it just keeps on going, going until some of the people have everything and most of the people have nothing. So that's basically the same thing with success. Well, if you think about success, obviously we think that we're going to be outrageously successful. If I ask my, my, my let's say my 15 year old students, of course they know they'll, they're going to make it. Even though, and even though they know that most of them aren't, but they themselves will. So maybe to be realistic about that, we really need to know ourselves. And that's where we come across this famous effect in psychology called the Dunning-Kruger effect. Which basically states that um, the less you know yourself, the, the less you know that you're bad at something. So that's why people who just start out doing something like playing music or sketching or whatever, they think they're absolutely amazing just because they don't know <laughs> uh, how great, how good the, the, the other people are that they haven't heard of. So let's say if you start out, you know, making some drawings when you're 14, 15, and you think that you're absolutely amazing, but you've never heard of, let's say, Rembrandt or, or um, Vermeer, or, you know, or some, some sort of techniques like Schiavoscura, which, which, which really plays with how the light plays out in different rooms. If you've never heard of that, then there's no way that you can tell that you're really not that good. So you really need to get a lot of more knowledge before you can really ascertain where you are. So this here, the peak of Mount Stupid, <laughs> I'm really a bit there myself, you know, when I was like 15 and I started reading some philosophical books, reading some Nietzsche, and I thought, all right, I know this shit, I know how it works, even though everybody else doesn't. And that's just because I, I really didn't know what else there was to learn, you know? So you run this risk. So if we want to be successful, we want to get skillful, we want to get knowledge, but of course, we have to go past this. All right, let's move on. Well, in psychological terms, um, what determines that some people are successful and others aren't? Well, my, in my earlier examples, like messy, you don't get to become messy just by sitting on the, on the couch and, and eating potato chips. You have to put in work, you have to practice. And obviously, we know about the, the rule of 10,000 hours. If you really, really want to be good at something, you need to spend like 10,000 hours doing that. And let's do a simple calculation here. If you take three to four hours each day, and you do it every day, maybe, you know, it's some weekends off or you go on a holiday for two weeks, okay, but for the rest you do it every day. Now let's say you can make a thousand hours in a year. So that means that in 10 years, you could be really good at something. And that's worthwhile, but that, of course, that requires that you have some sort of discipline that you put in the work and that you have the sort of personality to do that. Well, in um, personality psychology, we usually um, use the five-factor model for personality. Um, openness, which basically equals intelligence and creativity. Creativity, openness to experience. Creative people are usually quite interested in what happens around them. Conscientiousness really basically means working hard, you know, meeting your deadlines, doing what you're supposed to do. Extroversion or hobby, obviously, you know, agreeableness, you know, that you want to be nice, and uh, that you, want, you, know, you would like people to like you. And neuroticism, which is basically the mention of negative emotion. Well, it turns out success in that sense has a formula, which basically is openness plus conscientiousness. So you need to be intelligent. And that really quite makes sense, eh? in the sense that everything we value as a society basically is the product of intelligence. A great piece of art, there's a lot of intelligence and research obviously behind it. Anything that you could, could, could imagine is by all standards the result of intelligence. And obviously you need conscientiousness, you need to put in the work. And so when your friends call, you, know, you want to hang out and do beer and do you know, lots of fun stuff, you have to be able to say no. So put in the work and you have to have the intelligence for it and unfortunately there's really not much you can do to, you know, to increase that. Uh, if you knew that, that would be like uh, the philosopher's stone in science. Alright, so let's talk about the iceberg illusion. Because in our day and age, obviously we are uh, inclined not to have the right view of how much success people really have. What we see about them 
is of course, you know, the social media pictures, people jumping out of airplanes, you know, the tip of the iceberg, what they want you to see. And behind, below that, obviously, is all the pain and suffering that goes into it. But let's look at the pain and suffering and, and what you need to do, to do to get there. It starts out with dedication. And I like, kind of like this picture, you know, of, of an arrow hitting a target. Because that's really what dedication means. You have to have a target in life. Because, you know, uh, as we found out in philosophy, let's say since Immanuel Kant, there's no such thing as, let's just say, pure, neutral uh, observation. You know, uh, what you see in life, what you observe, what you contemplate, uh, is bound by a value system, by a hierarchy, and uh, that's bound by having a goal. So you need dedication, you, have, you need to have your goal to work towards. And of course that results into doing the hard work, doing your thing three, four hours a day. You know, me as a musician, it means you know, doing scales, which aren't really that much fun to do. But you have to do it. It's just getting your fingers to, to, to know those scales, that's, that's the hard work you have to put in. And of course that results in having good habits, you know, making it part of your daily routine. But then, obviously, comes the point of, of disappointment. Uh, because, you know, success is not some sort of golden road that has been paid for you. Let's look at some examples, you know. These are obviously the Beatles. And we've all heard of the Beatles, and uh, to, in my opinion, they, they're still one of the greatest bands that ever lived. Maybe the greatest, you know. They're uh, four really great musicians, but they didn't really just, you know, uh, appear like that all of a sudden. They, they put in the work. One story about the Beatles is, you know, that at one point um, they, took, they took a tram to the other part of Liverpool where they lived. You know, there was some, some guitarists who knew a chord that they, did, they haven't learned yet. So to learn, they, they, they did that. So they wanted to know everything about their skills. And they played like six hours every day in a club in, in Hamburg, Germany. Just They played so much until their fingers bled, you know, as, as uh, Brian Adams would say. But that's just what it takes to become the Beatles. And even after that, you know, when they wanted to get signed to a label, that they, they, uh, they showed a demo to, to DECA. And they were declined. They, yeah, the Beatles were declined. With the comment that, you know, their kind of guitar music really isn't for this era. People wouldn't like it. And interestingly enough, the guy that declined the Beatles later on went to decline the Rolling Stones as well. So you might question his uh, sense of good music. But anyway, you know, even the fact that the Beatles were declined for their first demo, and later on, of course, they went so went to become so successful, so great, and Beatlemania, and you, know, you could even hear themselves playing over the, the shouting of the girls in the audience. Uh, another example, J.K. Rowling, which is one of the, the greatest authors, and the, what makes her so great is then she, that in her, her books, the Harry Potter series, you know, it's not, not just a story um, that, that she came up with. It, it tells an archetypical story about these archetypes that we've had in our unconscious, collective unconscious for thousands of years, the mytholo mythological themes. I've been talking in one of my earlier series about you know, the hero's journey, which is uh, really thought of well by, by Thomas Campbell. And he says, well, you know, the hero he has to awaken to a call of adventure and then he has a mentor to guide him through the land of the unknown, which is obviously uh, also the Harry Potter story. Well, you know, the story goes that she made up these stories for her children because she had no money to, to really buy children's books. And even when she, she wrote down her stories, she didn't even have money to, to, to make copies, so she just wrote it out herself. And then her, her first uh, copies were declined by the publishers. So if, if you decline J.K. Rowling, then now you must discuss yourself, obviously. So even this great example of success, which she obviously is, it has all these aspects that you obviously have to go through, all of them, even the disappointment, the sacrifice, the failure, and eventually the persistence. Well, let's go to my reading tip for this week, and that would be Robert Greene's book called Master. Uh, so how do you become really good at something? Uh, there are some stages, there are some tips that you can follow in becoming really good. And that's how Robert Greene describes mastery in this excellent book. It's, he has written more excellent books like The 48 Laws of Power, which I would also highly recommend. But this is a great book to get acquainted with literature that tells you how to become a master. Really. All right, that's
that's it for this week's edition of Contemplate of Your Life or Your Life, sorry. And uh, I'll, hope, I'll hope to see you uh, next time.